Uh, Mr. Stilwell, Mr. Botts, and Mr. Shard. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. All right, Mr. Williams, Mr. Steele, Mr. Adams, and uh, Ms. Renard. Good morning. Good morning. All right, Mr. Kendrick and Ms. Hingerty. Good morning. All right, Mr. Hugh and Mr. Matthews Jr. and Senior. Good morning. Mr. Nichols, Mr. Harvey, Ms. Westmoreland. Good morning. And Mr. Ryan and Ms. D. Williams. Good morning. All right, Ms. Love, Mr. Atkins, Mr. Brown, Mr. Smith, and Ms. Uh, Hilton, good morning. Good morning. All right, Sergeant Ingram, all our jurors are present? Yes, sir. Okay, is there anything I need to cover before we bring them out? Nothing. Um, very, very Good morning, everybody. Um, Your Honor, would you consider a continuing objection? The state is objecting on cross-examination oftentimes to, uh, and I'm quoting, facts not in evidence. I researched that. That has only been used in closing argument and a hypothetical. So these are not hypothetical. So if, if it's okay with the court, can we have a uh, continuing objection to any ruling sustaining that type of objection? I'm not inclined to do that because there are circumstances where predicate facts are, have not been introduced before the fact finder and that objection would be valid. And then, okay. So I have to rule upon it on a case by case basis because I'm listening to the testimony as well. So, um, so it is a valid objection if you have an examination that either inserts facts that haven't been established yet or you haven't by agreement agree to those facts as of yet. But if I, but I'm talking about cross-examining, I'm not, I'm not saying it's not at times, but if I'm cross-examining someone and I say, you know, is Miss Jones outside? Something that may not be perfect, but, or Miss Porter outside, Keith Adams said that, the Honorable Keith Adams. And the objection, I believe, was sustained to facts not in evidence. And if I'm wrong, I'm just giving an example then. On cross-examination, you can, the questioner, that's the whole point, can ask about things that were not in evidence. They, have to, of course, have some sort of good faith belief, but um, they can ponder those questions. No one has to have it in evidence. Otherwise, we are tied to the federal rule of only things that came out on direct. No, because Georgia doesn't have a scope rule. So I, I, I'll, I'll consider on a case-by-case -case basis, but... Okay. Well, thank you. Okay. That, was, that was it. All right. Thank you, sir. Okay. All right, Sergeant Ingram, go ahead and summon our jurors, please.
All right, thank you, Sergeant Ingram. Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. All right, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, good morning. Good morning. All right. Without further delay, we're going to go ahead and continue with the presentation of the state's case. Um, all right, counsel, call your next witness. Good morning, Your Honor. The state at this time calls Gregory Pfeiffer to the stand. All right, summon Gregory Pfeiffer, please. Mr. Pfeiffer, good morning, sir. If you would please uh, go ahead and face Sergeant Ingram and uh, be sworn as a witness, please. Raise your right hand. This is what I first just want to give the truth, hold you not much truth. Yes, sir. Absolutely. State is going to be first class next to the court. Yes, sir. My name is Gregory Pfeiffer, G R E G O R Y P E I F F E R. Good morning, Mr. Pfeiffer. Good morning. Um, what is your current occupation? I'm currently a forensic biologist. And uh, where are you employed in, in that capacity? I'm employed at the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms and Explosives, commonly known as the ATF. And what is, uh, excuse me, uh, and what are your duties uh, at the ATF? My duties at the ATF are to be a forensic biologist, which means to process evidence as it relates to ATF incidents, to analyze evidence for DNA, to generate reports, and to testify in court. And have you worked in any other capacity prior to your employment with the ATF? Prior to my employment with the ATF, between 2012 and 2015, I was employed by the Georgia Bureau of Investigation, Department of Forensic Sciences, commonly known as the State Crime Lab. And what was your official uh, title or role there? My title at the GBI was also as a forensic biologist. And what were your duties or responsibilities at the GBI as a forensic biologist? Similar to those of the ATF as a forensic biologist, the duties are the same. So my duties at the Georgia Bureau Investigation were to process evidence from state and local agencies that was submitted to the GBI crime lab process that evidence for biological material, analyze biological material for the presence of DNA profiles, generate reports, and testify in court. And um, can you tell the jury what your educational background is? I received a Bachelor's of Science in the specialty of genetics from Iowa State University in 2004. Okay. I, also. I am not finished, sir. <laughs> and, and then in 2012, I received a, a doctor of philosophy, also in genetics. At that same time, I also received a graduate certificate in forensic sciences. I am now done. There we go. Yes, sir. <laughs> and uh, were you required to undergo any specialized training to become a forensic biologist? Okay. To be a forensic biologist, the specialized training really comes in, in on-the-job training. So at the Georgia Bureau, of, Georgia Bureau of Investigation, I underwent a many-month training program that included oral lectures, written examinations, uh, proctored examinations with evidence, uh, supervised casework uh, that ultimately culminated in a mock court. Um, I then once I joined the ATF, underwent that same training program, but as oversought by the, by the ATF at that time. So that would be my specialized training in forensic biology. And uh, Mr. Piper, do you belong to any professional organizations? I do. I belong to the American Academy of Forensic Sciences as a member of that organization. And how long have you been a part of that uh, organization? To my recollection, it would have been around 2014 to current. And is there a certification process to become a forensic biologist with the GBI? There is a certification process, but that is not a requirement to be a forensic biologist. There's actually a small subset of forensic biologists that are um, certified. There's a certifying body, the American Board of Crimin uh, Criminalistics. Um, I hold with that body a certification in molecular biology which is under the umbrella of uh, forensic DNA analysis. And um, I am current and 
uh, open with that certification. Okay. And have you been previously qualified to testify as a forensic biologist and DNA examiner? In court? Yes. Yes. And uh, about how many times? I believe this will be my 16th testimony, plus or minus one. Um, so I want to ask you, what is forensic biology? Forensic biology is the science of uh, analyzing evidence for the presence of biological material, uh, looking for the presence of blood, semen, saliva, analyzing that evidence to generate DNA profiles that can be used to compare to known DNA profiles uh, submitted from individuals to make associations uh, to the evidence. What is DNA? What is DNA? DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. It's the A's, C's, T's, and G's that, that you learned back in school. It's the basic building block of all life. Um, you receive half of your DNA from your mother and half your DNA from your father. It is set at conception. It remains the same throughout your life and throughout uh, various cells of your body. So we can use DNA from the inside of your mouth to compare to, to blood or DNA from the, the surface of your hands. Um, it is unique to an individual. So with the exception of identical siblings, be that twins, triplets, etc. But it's unique to an individual and can be used to draw associations of known DNA standards to evidence samples. And um, how is DNA deposited on items? DNA can be deposited on an item from any number of ways. Uh, as mentioned earlier, like what DNA is, uh, blood, semen, and saliva all contain DNA. And so if any of those substances are deposited onto an item of evidence, there may be DNA there. However, there's also something called touch DNA. And so I see, sir, that you have a water bottle on the floor as, sorry, I talked directly to the jury, but as if somebody were to pick up that bottle and touch it, you would deposit uh, DNA from the surface of your hand to, to that item, and that would be DNA that I could analyze as a forensic biologist. Let's expound upon that. How can um, DNA be collected from um, items of evidence? DNA collection process uh, starts with an evaluation, and I, I look at evidence and try to determine where DNA may be deposited on an item. The actual collection of that is I use uh, something similar to a Q-tip, commonly used to, to clean things around the house or on your physical person. Uh, we have sterile cotton swabs that we use to collect DNA. The standard process would be once I identify an area to swab, moisten that swab with um, liquid, a sterile water. Use that sterile wet swab to swab the evidence, to collect any biological material from the evidence onto the swab. I then follow that back up with a dry swab, similar to mopping the, the floor. If you, if you use your wet mop, uh, you still need to go back and clean it again. So we're trying to get all of the biological material off of an item of evidence and onto cotton swabs that I can then use in my DNA analysis process uh, pipeline. OK. And um, after you've performed that collection process, what else, if anything, do you do after that? Sure. The DNA collection process is just the first step of DNA analysis. We need to obtain DNA from the evidence and move that to our DNA analysis pipeline. The pipeline can be thought of as, as five basic steps. The first step is DNA extraction. So we would cut the swabs that I took from the evidence and put that into a tube and add chemicals to break apart the cellular material that's there, to wash away any um, substances from the evidence itself, and so we end up with a, a purified sample with, with DNA in it. The next step is then to figure out how much DNA I had. I don't know at this point in time if I obtained any DNA from an evidence sample. So I use my quantitation step to determine whether or not any DNA is present on my evidence. After that, I use that information in the next step to use something similar to like a molecular Xerox machine. So something if you were making photocopies of a piece of paper, you would put it in and make hundreds to millions of copies of that piece of paper. I do that using instrumentation and chemicals in the laboratory to uh, amplify and generate multiple copies of the small amount of DNA I obtained from the evidence. After that, I use sensitive instrumentation to detect uh, the DNA sample uh, that I just processed and amplified. 
The final step in my DNA analysis process is looking at the data that comes off of my sensitive instrumentation to determine whether or not a DNA profile is suitable for comparison. Okay. Um, so I would like to ask you, what is a DNA profile? A DNA profile is a collection of data as it pertains to um, somebody's DNA. And so if we think of a, a DNA profile as a collection of data from particular locations throughout your DNA, and in the testing that I, I normally do, uh, we would look at anywhere from uh, 15 uh, locations of the DNA, and each one of those locations um, would give me information. And so if we look at it uh, graphically, it's much like every other graph. It's an X with a Y axis where size is on the X axis going across and how tall the peak is is how much information is present. At each one of the locations of DNA that I look at, if we go back to the definition of DNA, you get half from your mother and half from your father. I can expect uh, two pieces of information, one from each individual that donated DNA to your life, and sometimes those are separate and sometimes they're stacked at the same uh, information came across from both parents. And so that collection of data, the number of peaks, the size of the peaks, um, is the information that I put together to build the DNA profile. <clears throat> okay, what is DNA comparison? DNA comparison. As I generate DNA profiles from evidence, that can only do so much. To be able to associate that or include or exclude any uh, particular individuals from that evidence, we need to have a known standard from an individual. I would run the known standard, um, similar to the rest of my standard DNA testing. Um, I would generate a DNA profile from the known standard, and then once I have all of that information for those two DNA profiles, it's as simple as looking at one, looking at the other, um, and determining whether or not there's a match or if they're the same. So if we think of the simplest option, a single source DNA profile to a known standard, I would expect that they would give me the same DNA information at each location that I would see in the DNA uh, profile. And when you say a known standard, what do you mean by that? So known standards typically come in as something called a buckle swab, which is a fancy word to say just the cells on the inside of your mouth. So as known standards are collected, it's usually that same cotton swab that I use to collect from the evidence, uh, but it's used on the inside of an individual's mouth, uh, packaged and sent into the laboratory, um, saying that these samples came from this individual. And what are the potential outcomes of DNA comparison once you finish your analysis? So as I make comparisons, the basic determination is whether or not there's a possibility that somebody is included in the evidence, meaning the DNA types match, that they're similar across, or that a person is excluded, meaning that there's at least one difference in the DNA, that they're, they're not included um, as a particular uh, sample. So, inclusion and exclusion with the level of testing here. What are the quality standards, uh, if any, for DNA examination? <clears throat> there are various accrediting bodies for crime laboratories, uh, such as um, the American Society of Crime Laboratory Directors Laboratory Accreditation Board, or ASCLAD Lab, um, who then audit a laboratory to a certain set of standards, uh, the International Organization Standard 17025, for example, uh, which is what the accreditation standard for the Georgia Bureau of Investigation was when I was there. Um, there's also another uh, set of quality standards. These are uh, written and published by the Federal Bureau of Investigation, and they're known as the Quality Assurance Standards, or QAS. Um, it is also a series of uh, requirement documents that a laboratory must meet and then are audited to on a regular schedule. Um, have you had the opportunity to personally perform DNA analysis? I have. Okay. And um, how do you determine whether a known DNA profile is consistent with a known sample profile? So as stated previously, it, it can be as simple if it can be as simple as looking at a known DNA standard and comparing that to a, an evidence sample. So if we take just one location of DNA and I see that well, there's a 910 at this location and the reference standard is also a 910, 
at that, there's, a, there's an inclusion at that location. And then I do that for each location throughout the DNA profile, so up to 15 locations. And if they match it every single one of those, then uh, there, every single one of those that is used in comparison then is a, a match. And um, how do you determine whether a DNA, DNA profile is, and a known sample uh, are suitable for comparison? <clears throat> Start with known samples. Um, determine whether or not a known sample is suitable for comparison. Um, it, it needs to meet the expectation. Known samples should be a single source DNA profile. If I receive a known sample and there's indication there's two or three people involved in that sample, I'm not going to use it any further. I'm going to make that not suitable for comparison because it is not a single person as expected. Looking at evidence samples to determine whether or not an evidence sample is suitable for comparison. And there's a list of protocols within the laboratory as governed by the two accrediting bodies that we previously discussed. As long as the DNA profile meets the requirements of the laboratory, if we're able to determine the number of contributors that are contributing DNA to the sample, if we're able to use our interpretation protocols, our, our flow charts, if they, would, if they are flow charts, to determine whether or not you can pull a major contributor or pull one sample out from a larger uh, mixture component. Uh, that, through training and experience and the laboratory's protocols, is how you end up determining whether or not a sample is suitable for comparison. <clears throat> and uh, are the procedures and analysis that you have given uh, the jury understanding of uh, something that is generally accepted within the scientific community? They are. And uh, are the procedures that you describe reliable and reproducible? They are. And uh, did you follow these procedures for the case that you're currently here to test about? I did. Your Honor, at this time, the state now moves to qualify Mr. Gregory Piper as, uh, as an expert in the fields of forensic biology and DNA examination based upon his background, training, and experience, as so testified. No objection on behalf of Mr. Williams, sir. Right, anybody else wish to vote out of the witness? Okay. Um, the court will designate. Um, Mr. Pfeiffer is an expert in the area of forensic biology and DNA testing. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Pfeiffer, did you, did, when, during your employment with the GBI, were you required to produce reports? Yes, there's a standard practice of my position is to analyze evidence and issue reports to that analysis. And did you prepare one for this case that you're here to talk about today? Yes, sir. I am now showing defense what has been previously provided. Uh, states exhibits 143 Charlie, states 143 Charlie Alpha. Okay. Your Honor, with your permission, the state's exhibit is 143 Charlie and 143 Charlie Alpha. You may, sir. Thank you. Mr. Piper, starting um, with uh, state's 143 Charlie, uh, what about this This is a Georgia Bureau of Investigation, Department of Forensic Sciences official report to the analysis that I performed in this case. And um, how do you know what it is? Well, I can see the, the header of the report that has the DOFS case number listed at the top, including my name, title, and signature at the end of the report. What is states 143, Charlie Allen? This document, 143 Charlie Alpha, is the Department of Forensic Sciences STR Frequency Report. Uh, 
In more simpler terms, this is the document that supports the statistical uh, conclusion made and supported in this report. And how do you know that uh, what is H143 Charlie Alpha? I recognize it again by the header of the report, uh, a note by our laboratory information management system that it was inserted into the record by myself on April 2nd, 2014, and that the analyst of record on the document is Gregory Pfeiffer, which again is me. And has either uh, exhibit uh, states 143 Charlie or 143 Charlie Alpha been altered in any way? The state's exhibit number has been added to both documents. Um, you're at this time, but other than that, it is materially the same, same way as you last prepared. Other than that, I see no differences. Thank you. At this time, you're under the state now moves uh, to admit states 143 Charlie and 143 Charlie Alpha into evidence at this time. Can I object on continuing witness, which you said we take up later, otherwise, I don't have an objection for purposes of this. Uh, if he needs the first testimony. Hi. Your Honor, I'll my objection is also that it's here set. I understand the live testimony of the report itself. Okay. Um, there are, your objection is overruled, and I'll take up the other issue um, uh, later, but it will be admitted uh, as states 143 Charlie and 143 Charlie Alpha. Thank you, Your Honor. If <clears throat> he publishes, you see fit. Thank you, Your Honor. And if he's coming up. as opposed to, you, there's a screen right next to your left, uh, which will make it a lot easier for you to do the Okay, um, starting at the top, is there a DOFS case number associated with this report? There is, it is 2013-102-0281. And um, what does DOFS stand for? Department of Forensic Sciences. It is a department of the Georgia Bureau of Investigation. And upon what date are you seeing on this report, uh, what date are you seeing on this document that this report was prepared? This report is dated and issued as of April 10th, 2014. It is in the header in the bottom right. And can you describe what it is that uh, ASCLAB uh, Lab International Accredited is? On the ASCLAD Lab, this is in the middle, right next to the barcode. This is the American Society of Crime Laboratory Directors Laboratory Accreditation Board. This is the accreditation board that I referred to earlier as far as uh, quality standards for a testing laboratory. Um, it is just noting that uh, in 2014, the Georgia Bureau Investigation adhered to these standards. Um, based on your report, um, did the GBI crime lab receive any evidence pertinent to this case? You can scroll down a little bit. Is this a touch screen? Oh, actually, it's control from here. Okay. So standard on these laboratory reports, uh, near the top, of the report, there's a section called evidence. This lists the evidence that the laboratory received uh, from the state or local agency to test for uh, forensic means. And in this case are the samples that I tested in this case. Okay. And um, what are the, uh, what did the, if you would uh, itemize and go uh, line by line, what you received from this in, in this case? Line by line, yeah. So, for clarity's sake, I'm going to start at the second main bullet on the evidence that was received on October 24th, 2013, from the Atlanta Police Department via lockbox. Evidence that comes into the laboratory comes in through a lockbox. Uh, once it is in the lockbox, it is then accessible to the uh, laboratory employees. The evidence that was received is a sealed package containing evidence for uh, forensic examination. 
Once it was in the laboratory, it was then sub-exhibited. So exhibit three is a package of evidence from <coughs> the agency. Uh, item 3A, as noted on this report, was sub-designated from other evidence. And it is a Ruger 9 millimeter firearm bearing the serial number listed here on the report, 302-44. 238. The next item of evidence is item four. It is again a package containing evidence for forensic examination. The exact um, items are exact forensic examinations are listed on that line item. Um, but it was then sub designated as 4A, which is a Taurus 9mm pistol bearing the serial number TCX63132. The next item of evidence was Exhibit 5, again, a package of evidence that was sub-designated as 5A, a Taurus 40 caliber pistol with a serial number of SAN09791. The next three items of evidence are the known DNA samples that we discussed earlier, uh, samples that were taken from a particular individual submitted to the laboratory as known samples. These are identified as items 6, 7, and 8. Item six are buckle swabs from one Frederick Prothro. Item seven, buckle swabs from a Walter Murphy. Item eight are buckle swabs from an Adrian Bean. So that was the evidence that the, the laboratory received from the Atlanta Police Department. The top of the evidence list, to reference that so we can go back, these are items of evidence, as noted on the report, that were created by myself, uh, Gregory A. Pfeiffer. Um, there are exhibits 11 through 15. Exhibits 11 and 12 are swabs that were correct collected from items 4A and 5A, respectively. Uh, they are swabs of potential stain that were identified on the firearm that were outside of the requested examination, saved for future possible testing. Exhibits 13, 14, and 15 are saved DNA product, DNA extract. So I had more DNA that I, need, that I needed for my testing. So we retained this uh, within the laboratory. They are uh, 13, 14, and 15 from items 3A, 4A, and 5A, respectively. I want to go back to a few things that you spoke about earlier um, during your response. When you say sub-designated, what does that mean? That's a great question. So if we receive evidence that has multiple components inside of a single box, for instance, if there was evidence that came in that had a firearm, an ammunition magazine, as well as intact ammunition cartridges, it is easier for tracking throughout the laboratory and denoting where samples came from to sub-designate that evidence using letters in this instance. So 3A, uh, for example, the firearm became 3A, and it is beyond my recollection for you know, the ammunition magazine and the uh, ammunition cartridges on what those are designated. But we can speak directly to a subset of the evidence by sub-designating these numbers. And earlier you talked about a lockbox. Can you tell the jury why evidence can arrive in a lockbox? Yeah. So quite often, when state and local agencies need to deliver evidence to the state crime lab, there needs to be a secure chain of custody from the submitter to the laboratory. There needs to be an interaction between those two entities. To facilitate that, you would need in-person interaction or a secure means of transfer. The secure means of transfer is what was used at the Georgia Bureau of Investigation via a lockbox. The agency, submitting agency, can show up at the crime lab, access through a secure door, access a secure locker, submit the evidence to the laboratory, make the request for what forensic examinations they need to do, place it into that lockbox. Once it is closed, it is only then accessible to the laboratory. That maintains that chain of custody that they put it in and the only people that can get it out are the crime lab. We then, once we get the evidence, enter it into evidence within a case number. In this case, we've discussed the case number. Okay. Earlier, you, earlier you described a 
describe that you received this uh, the evidence that you test here from the Atlanta Police Department. Can based on your report, from whom who requested testing on this uh, evidence that you uh, analyzed here? Referencing the report, it is a D. Quinn that requested this examination. Are there case subjects associated with this report? Referencing the report, there are four individuals listed in the case individual section. Three of them are denoted as subjects, an Adrian Bean, a Frederick Prothro, a Walter Murphy, and then there's one designated as victim, E. Robeson-EL. Earlier you stated that, and if you will scroll down just ever so slightly, thank you, right there. Earlier you stated that you created certain evidence uh, numbers or evidence within this report that is referenced. Can you tell the truth why that was? So any product of my examination needs to be tracked for a chain of custody. Just like all evidence, we need to maintain the chain of custody uh, to um, provide integrity. In this case, the DNA extracts that I generated, again, I did my five, six step process, DNA collection, extraction through uh, profile development. If I didn't use all of the DNA, if I didn't consume the sample to generate my DNA profile, I have evidence left over at that point. I have extracted DNA that could be saved for potential retesting in the future. Uh, with that, I then create within our laboratory information management system an item of evidence, a tracking number for that evidence. Uh, same goes for exhibits 11 and 12, the swabbing of those two stains on items 4A and 5A. Um, I took swabs that I did not use in my testing, and those need to be tracked uh, throughout our system for potential use at a later time. Uh, that's why those were all entered as as new evidence or created by me through my testing process. And is that something that you would routinely do throughout your time at the GBI if the occasion should arise? Yes. Uh, anytime that I create something or I uh, generate some sort of continuing evidence, I create a number for it and enter it into our laboratory information management system. Just a brief indulgence, Shadow. And Mr. Piper, I'm going to direct you to your left, where there are some gloves right behind you, and would ask that if you would retrieve two for yourself and two for me. Let's go, thank you. Charlie, 146, Charlie. Would you like some gloves to hold? Sure. No? Okay. I can hold them for you if you want, since you don't. These are good. Yes, ma'am. I believe, yes. 147, Charlie, 148, Charlie, 144, Charlie, 145, Charlie, 146, Charlie. Yes, correct. So the, the duplicate 144, Charlie, will become 149, Charlie, this one. And that, which is, yes. Sorry. No. Get some more. Some more. Disinfectant tests. So that's perfect. 
it's going to be. I saw you, I heard you. <laughs> All right, I am now approaching you, Mr. Piper, with state's exhibits 147, Charlie, 148, Charlie, 149, Charlie, 146, Charlie, and 145, Charlie. Uh, can you take a moment to review what I have just handed you and uh, look, look at me after you have done so? States exhibits 145 Charlie to 149 Charlie. Sure. Three of these, 145 Charlie, 146 Charlie, and 149 Charlie, are the known reference samples um, that are listed in my report as items six, seven, and eight. I recognize them by the DOFS case number on the sticker, um, as well as hard to see, but across the evidence tape, as I resealed the evidence after testing my initials, GAP, just like the store, and the date, along with the evidence sticker that includes the, the known reference sample names. These two, which are 147 Charlie and 148 Charlie, are the two exhibits that are listed at the top of the report. So it, DOFS numbers 11 and 12, which are swabs of stains from items 4A and 5A. Recognize these by my handwriting listing out the DOFS case number, a description written on the package, date, my initials, as well as for sealing purposes, my initials across the tape, and none of these look to have been open since I last closed them. Your Honor, at this time, the state now moves based on the testimony to admit state's exhibits 149, oh, excuse me, 145 Charlie through 149 Charlie into evidence at this time. Any objection to state's uh, 145 through 149 Charlie? Yes, Your Honor. Basis? There's no foundation, but the prosecutor promised me they call Officer Benton, so I'm, I'm okay with letting it in with that condition, and that's what the prosecutor told me. All right, please, I'll vote. I'll overrule your objection at this point in time, subject to um, the your agreement, okay? All right, and uh, so one, states 145 through 149 are admitted. Maybe publish as you <laughs> All right, uh, Mr. <coughs> I handed you some scissors. Start with states 145, Charlie, and open it with So at this point, for clarity, I apologize to ask for clarity. To open this, I do not know what is inside of this. For evidence integrity, I don't have a clean surface. I'm not wearing proper PPE, so I, I will open. Just want to open it with that understanding. Yes, please open. Yes, sir. There is 
one more envelope inside yes. of that envelope. And if you would just be as kind as just opening and looking inside without putting evidence on the top of the witness stand, it would be appreciated. Would you like me to remove the evidence? You can just look inside and tell the jury what you see inside. Yes. So inside this package, there are cotton swabs, similar to the Q-tips we discussed earlier. They're wooden sticked with a cotton flocked end. And these are the buckle samples from uh, identified as Walter Murphy. Okay. All right. Let's transition to state's exhibit number 46, Charlie. Would you do with stage Inside this package is the same. They're wooden stick cotton swabs. Quantity appears to be four. Cannot confirm based on taking it out. But it is evidence tape sealed, my initials and date, uh, listed as from Adrian Bean. All right. Um, would you do it and replace that, please? Um, would you do the same time before the seventh time? 147, Charlie? Yes, sir. For the next, for the next. The next reference sample? Yes. That would be listed as 149, Charlie. Yes, This evidence also contains swab wrappers containing the swab sticks. Again, wooden stick, cotton end, identified as Frederick Prothrow. And as we I have never done this, but I would recommend against opening this on the stand as it will compromise the integrity of the evidence for future testing. Your Honor, I believe we could open the evidence and present it as such, provided the court has no objection. Well, he's telling me he recommends you not open it. So I'm going to follow his direction, okay? <laughs> so, and I'm going to follow you. Okay, all right. So... All right, um, so uh, I'm going to re uh, reclaim these uh, exhibits from you. That works. All right. Let me ask you something. Can you open it up in a controlled uh, or um, in another space and let everybody look at it? I, I could. If, if you provide me some bleach, a mask, a lab coat, <laughs> brand new gloves, okay. uh, proper PPE, or either in the court or, or outside, I would be be happy to open it. Okay, all right. Thank We're going to follow your instructions. I think we'll defer for the time. Okay. okay. All right. Um, and I am now going to approach with the states, uh, with the assistance of Deputy Ingram, State's Exhibit 140. <laughs> 114, Charlie. But prior to doing so, Your Honor, I am going to allow the 
Offense Council to see, see states 114. Charlie? This item contained in this box, 114 Charlie, is DOFS item number three in its entirety, which contains 3A. I recognize this based on the DOFS case number written on the sticker, my initials, and date across the evidence tape on the box. Okay. Bless you. I am now going to reclaim from you states 114, 114 Charlie. Show you what has been also pre marked as states 115 Charlie, which has already been shown to defense counsel. And with the last exhibit, would you please open that exhibit and tell me what it is that I'm in? This exhibit 115 Charlie is DOFS case number or item number four, which contains item 4A. And what is item 4A? Item 4A is one Taurus 9mm pistol bearing the serial number TCX 63132. Okay. I'm going to claim for you uh, states 115 Charlie. And I'm going to read, uh, I'm going to give you again what states 114, Charlie. And can you tell me, or tell the jury, excuse me, what uh, is contained, what, what, is, what is the item that is contained? States 114, Charlie. Evidence, yes, sir. Are you going to use Is there an objection, Mr. Steele? Yes, sir. What's your objection? Not an evidence yet. I sustain the objection. You can just lay a little more foundation, okay? 
What is contained in states 114, Charlie? I'll overrule that, okay? And it's the same premise. I'll overrule the objections. Okay, because he's got to identify the he's got to be able to identify the the item, okay? You may answer. That question. 114 Charlie contains one Ruger 9mm pistol bearing the serial number 3024423 along with the rest of item 3. Okay. And does it uh is the box that I handed you also contain a serial number that pertains to your report? This box has the DOFS case number on the DOFS case sticker, as well as my initials and date that I sealed the box. And as I'll ask you a question, is 114, Charlie, which I reclaimed from you, also one of the items that you tested, uh, well, t took a sample from? I took a sample from 114, Charlie. Did you also take a sample from States 115, Charlie? This is item 114, Charlie. 115, Charlie. Right. Yes, I did also sample from 115, Charlie, which was discussed earlier as the Taurus 9mm. All right. And I am now going to show you what had been previously marked as states 116, Charlie. And as with the prior exhibit, I'm going to ask you to look in, and after you consult, if you would contain therein, look up at me and tell me what's in it. Is that what you're looking at? One sixteen Charlie contains DOFS item number five, which is one Taurus forty caliber pistol bearing the serial number SAN zero nine seven nine one. And is that uh, exhibit that you have in front of you also uh, an item that you took a swap from? Um, at the time you performed your analysis for this case. This is an item that I sampled from for this case. Just to bring indulgence, Charlie. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, did that conclude your involvement with this case? The, the DNA testing of this evidence concludes the involvement with this case. Brief indulgence, Your Honor. Yes, sir. At this time, Your Honor, the state now moves to admit in the evidence states 114, Charlie, 115, Charlie, 116, Charlie. Any objection to states 114, 115, or 116, Charlie? Your Honor, based upon our previous agreement, I won't object, so if it's not up. You can renew your objection at that time. Okay. okay. All right. That's fine. All right. States uh, 114, Charlie, 115, Charlie, and 116, Charlie are admitted subject to additional foundation. All right. And maybe publish the jury as you see fit. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, with respect to your report, um, the analysis that you concluded, can you tell the jury what your uh, conclusions were with respect to your test? Yeah. Would you like me to go through the whole yes, testing item and response, item by item? With this testing, we sampled the, the grips, the textured areas of the grips, and the trigger from each of the three firearms discussed earlier. DFS items 3A, 4A, and 5A. Grouping them for clarity, the DNA profiles obtained from 3A and 5A were not suitable for comparison. They were both at least three uh, individuals contributing to that DNA profile and were not suitable for comparison. The DNA profile obtained from item 4A was also from at least three individuals, as noted in the report. And we were able to identify a major 
contributor that was suitable for comparison in that profile. Within the report, this is identified as the first DNA profile. Um, it is a, a profile that is suitable for comparison. The other components of that mixture, persons two and three, were not suitable for comparison, so we didn't draw any conclusions or any comparisons to those components. There was a comparison made to the major DNA profile from item 4A. We compared that DNA profile to the known standards from Frederick Prothrow, from Walter Murphy, and to Adrian Bean. The comparison showed that there was Walter Murphy was a possible contributor to the major component DNA profile obtained from item 4A. The other two individuals were excluded as possible contributors to this profile. So that means that Frederick Prothrow and Adrian Bean were excluded as contributors to the major component of item 4A. The weight of that association, or the statistical number that accompanies that statement that Walter Murphy was included as a possible contributor, is this. Assuming the, the major component is a single contributor, the probability of randomly selecting an unrelated individual within the population is 1 in 5 trillion Caucasians and 1 in 230 billion African Americans. Earlier you stated just a few moments ago that they were not, they were, that the results that you got were not suitable for comparison to use your words. Can you tell the jury what you mean by that? Sure. A profile is either suitable for comparison or not suitable for comparison based on the laboratory's protocols and the analyst's training and experience. For example, if there is a four or five or more individuals contributing to a DNA profile, the complexity is just far too great for the DNA analyst to make associations to that profile. Um, if there isn't enough information within a DNA profile to draw conclusions, that profile is also not suitable for comparison. And so in this case, with items 3A, the DNA profiles obtained from items 3A and 5A were not suitable for comparison based on the laboratory's protocols and my training experience at that time. Was there, and in the process of your analysis, what, was there something that was suitable for comparison? Yes, okay. the major component from item 4A was suitable for comparison based on the laboratory's protocols at that time. Okay, and um, what was the result of that comparison analysis? The result of that comparison is that we compared the DNA profile obtained from the major component of 4A to the three known individuals submitted in this case. Frederick Prothrow and Adrian Bean were excluded as possible contributors to that major component. Walter Murphy was included as a possible contributor to that major component given the statistics stated, early, stated earlier. How were you able to say that there were three contributors to the mixtures on the submissions of 3A and 5A? Based on the information um, that we have of how DNA works, we get half from a mother, half from a father, and if we remember there are locations of DNA, your, the DNA you obtain from your mom, the DNA you obtain from your dad are both going to show up at each location. And so at each location of DNA, I have an expectation for a single individual that at most I'm going to see two peaks, right? one from mom, one from dad. As more individuals contribute to a DNA sample, I'm going to see more peaks. If I see four, expectation of two individuals. If I see six, expectations of three, continues on with that level. Um, knowing that it isn't always that simple because there could be stacking of similar DNA types between individuals or within the same individual if you receive the, DNA, the same DNA type from your mother and your father. But that is part of the protocols and the training experience to be able to interpret the DNA profile. But looking at the number of peaks and the relation of the peaks in those DNA profiles, we were able to determine that it was at least three individuals contributing to those samples.
And Mr. Pfeiffer did, Mr. Pfeiffer, excuse me, did that conclude your involvement with this case? Yes, sir. At this time, Your Honor, I am reclaiming State's Exhibit 116, and um, the State is now the first of the defense for any cross examination. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, we want to take a comfort break first? Okay. All right. Um, Councilors, uh, we're going to, and jurors, we're going to be in recess for about maybe five, ten minutes to so allow everybody to take comfort. We'll come back, okay? All right. All rise. Jury's left us, Mr. Pfeiffer. You can take 10 minutes, just come back, okay? All right, we're in recess for 10 minutes.
All right, thank you, Sergeant Ingram. Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. All right, Cross. Uh, good morning, Doctor. I just have a couple of questions for you, if I may. You're given, um, in essence, three firearms and the items that came with the firearms that you um, looked at and identified here today. Is that fair to say? That is correct. And on two of the firearms, there was not enough um, DNA to test um, to determine what, who was a major contributor. Is that a fair analysis of what you told us? That is a, an explanation. However, I would expand upon that and say, uh, in these instances, there's almost too much DNA to test, given that uh, the numbers of contributors that were in these samples were higher than the complexity in which I could uh, evaluate the sample. So it wasn't too little information. It was uh, the complexity of the profile. And then the one... Um firearm that you were able to have a major contributor. Just tell, ladies and gentlemen, jury, which firearm that was. That was the firearm from item 4A to reference the report, so I the correct firearm is the Taurus 9mm pistol. And then you have major contributors and not major contributors. Is that a fair way to say it? The major contributor and the non-suitable minor components. And the major contributor, you said, is to a scientific um, degree that you specified already, is a gentleman you're calling Mr. Walter Murphy. Fair to say? There is evidence to include Walter Murphy as a possible contributor to the major component from that DNA profile, given the scientific weight um, stated earlier. Now, you also mentioned that a gentleman... Uh, Mr. Prethro, remember that name? Yes. And he was excluded from the major component of that DNA. Is that fair to say? Yes. From the component of the profile that we made comparisons to, he was excluded from that component. And the same question and the same answer, I believe, for uh, the person named Mr. Bean. Fair. Professor Dave, a standing objection is to form. You can rephrase it, Mr. Okay. <laughs> It's going to be the same question. As to Mr. Bean, remember that name? Yes, sir. Adrian Bean. Um, that person, DNA, the known sample, was excluded from the major contributor on that item. Is that fair to say? Yes, from the component of the mixture that I was able to draw comparisons to, uh, Mr. Adrian Bean was also excluded. OK. 
action does not mean that Mr. Bean was not on that firearm, but we're talking about the major component. True? That is correct. No assumptions or comparisons were made to the additional contributors beyond, as the report identifies, uh, I think it's Mr. Murphy. First profile of the major component? Mr. Murphy. Mr. Mur well, the, the sample that is associated with Mr. Murphy. I want to thank you, Doctor. Your Honor, thank you so much. All right, any further examination? No, yes, Your Honor. I did not you yet. <laughs> okay. All right, Mr. Matthews. Mr. Pfeiffer, good, good morning, sir. Good morning, sir. I just have a few questions. You talked about touch DNA. Mm -hmm. uh, with respect to touch DNA, can you explain to the jury what exactly is the DNA material or life material that is in the hand that is transferred to items? Yeah. So touch DNA uh, is sort of a catch-all for biological material in which we haven't otherwise characterized. So we have serology tests for uh, serology meaning uh, bodily fluids uh, for blood and semen and saliva to determine those types. Touch DNA is a category for uh, oftentimes a low level DNA that uh, we don't have other eyes characterized. Most often when touch DNA is used as a term, it, it truly means because something was touched. Um, and so to answer specifically the question, what is it, what, uh, what, where's the DNA come from when we talk about touch DNA? So throughout the day, uh, your epithelial cells, which is a scientific word for the cells that make up this, the skin or your hand, uh, those end up falling off or being pulled off. So if you think of, like if you're sandpapering an item and you end up sandpapering your hand, you can feel a little bit of your skin actually come off. So those would be the cells that we're looking at. But that, that's a natural process throughout the day, depending on how long it is from the time at which you wash your hands and the time you touch something, you may have a different amount of, of DNA that's left behind. But not only the DNA contained within cells is uh, present in touch DNA. Sometimes there's non-cellular DNA or, or cell-free DNA uh, that uh, the cells are even lysed and there's just DNA on your hand. Or, um, you know, you may have touched something else and, and picked up that DNA from touch. Is it possible to leave the cell from the hand on a door handle of an automobile? Yes, it is. Uh, common to anything that we touch. Anything can we come in contact throughout the entire day. Your cell phone, the door, the railings, um, all have the potential for leaving touch DNA behind. How about a cell phone? Yes. About a ring. I believe you said a ring? A ring. Yeah. Yes, I, I would actually expect quite a high level of DNA on the ring that I'm currently wearing. About, uh, I think you testified earlier about a handgun, correct? Yes. Hand, handguns are something that you would touch. How about if you were, how about a jacket? Yes. Where, where, would, the, where would the cellular uh, evidence be transferred if you were wearing a, dra a jacket? So we talked specifically about touch DNA from your hand, but the entire human body is covered in epithelium. Your entire body is covered in skin. And so when we talk about skin or epithelial cells, touch DNA cells, if you will, um, coming off your hand, any part of your body. So the, the collar of my shirt is rubbing up against my neck. I am depositing DNA from myself onto my, my clothing, my jacket, my pants as my wrists are touching them. Anything that we come in contact with, it's not limited to the hands. It could be your forehead. If you're leaning up against a wall, you could deposit <clears throat> DNA from your person to an item. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Pfeiffer. No further questions. Yes, sir. Anyone else? Any redirect? I know you are. All right. May Dr. Pfeiffer be permanently or temporarily excused the witness? Uh, permanently. All right, Dr. Pfeiffer, thank you for your patience with us. I'm going to permanently excuse you as a witness. You're free to go about your usual duties and advocation. Just don't discuss your testimony with anybody except the attorneys in this case, okay? Yes, sir. All right, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. All right. State and uh, representative from the defense, can I get you to come up, please?
Okay, ladies and gentlemen, let me kind of just tell you where we are um, and let you know kind of the plan, the way ahead. Um, I'd like to be able to delay our lunch just a little bit so we can take a witness, but the the, the trade-off is that we're going to recess for the day after this, after that particular witness, and depending upon the length. Okay, so you get an early afternoon, and as I as I mentioned earlier. Um, tomorrow, Friday, we'll, you'll you'll appear for twelve thirty. We'll, uh, we'll we'll get started around one o'clock and work the, the you know the afternoon. All right. So can we do that? Just we'll take another witness, see what the length of time is, and if it's um, where I think it will probably be, we're probably going to recess some somewhere between one and two o'clock for the afternoon. Okay. All right. Call your next witness, madam. Or, sir. Your Honor, the state calls Mr. Eduardo Nava Flores to stand. All right, summon Mr. Nava Flores, please. All right, Mr. Nava Flores, good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Sir, if you would please approach the witness stand once you get there. Before you sit down, if you would turn and face Sergeant Ingram to be sworn as a witness, please. Uh, stand up, please. Okay, there you go. All right. That's why I first told you to give the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. Yes, sir. Have a seat. It's Eduardo Nava, E D U A R D O N A V A. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Did you, uh, do you know or did you used to know a Miss uh, Marcella Cisneros? Maricela. How did you know her? I dated her. And when did y'all first meet? Couldn't tell you. Yeah, I was 18, 2000. Seven, eight. And back in 2013, did y'all have a relationship then? Yes. Uh, were you all dating at that point? I believe so, yes. And was she ever a student anywhere? Yes, she was a student at Kennesaw. And when she was a student at Kennesaw, where did, uh, in 2013, where did you live? Um, I was bouncing around. I didn't really have a house. I was staying at her place sometimes. I lived in Daunt sometimes, sometimes with some friends. Sorry. Yes. Sometimes I'd stay in Dalton. Sometimes I would stay with her. Sometimes with friends. I was kind of bouncing around. Sometimes in my truck. Understood. And did she live near where she was going to school? I believe she lived at the school. And did she ever have a car back then? She did have a car. Uh, what kind of car was it? It was a red car. I don't remember exactly what model or make. Did you have a car back then? I did not have a car. Would you ever use her car? I would borrow her car, yes. And uh, on September 11, 2013, uh, can you uh, describe to the jury how that day started? I think it started normally. Uh, I think I needed to borrow the car. I don't think I needed it, but uh, she let me borrow the car. I dropped her off at school, and um, we, I took off from there. And when you dropped her off at school, did you have anyone with you? No. I don't believe I did. Did you ever pick anyone up? Um, I don't exactly know how I met with Brian, but yes. And what is uh, Brian's last name? I believe it's Ran Ranson. And how did you know him? I knew him for a couple of years. I don't exactly know how I met him. And uh, did he end up in, in her car that you were driving? Yes, we ended up in the same car. We think we were headed towards uh, the mall. And where was that mall? I don't exactly know. Uh, in general, was it in Atlanta, outside Atlanta? Um, don't exactly know what the outskirts of Atlanta are or what is Atlanta. I considered Kennesaw Atlanta, so obviously I'm wrong on that. That's fair. <laughs> Did you have to travel far from uh, the Kennesaw area to get to that mall? Um, I don't exactly know how long I've been driving, but we were driving on the interstate for a good minute. And after y'all were at the mall, did y'all ever go anywhere else? Um, after that... We wanted to get some weed. Um, I think uh, Brian knew exactly where to get it, so he led me to a place. Uh, and did he, without, uh, did he ever speak with anyone over the phone when you were with him? I'm not exactly sure if he spoke with anybody. So, uh, did he give you directions to where you were going? Yes. And when you got there, uh, had you ever been that area before? No. 
Do you know uh, where that area is? No. Did Brian give you the address of where you were? No. Uh, when you got there, what did you see? Was it a, what was the location you all brought to? A gas station. And when you got to that gas station, did Brian speak with anyone, whether in person or over the phone? I don't think he spoke with anybody. After that, what did y'all do in that gas station initially? We waited for a minute. And what did you do after waiting at the gas station? We left that gas station. Where did you go? We went to where he knew where to get some weed. And how close was it to that gas station? I'd say about 15 minutes, 10, 15 minutes. And uh, when you got there, was it a house, an apartment? Where was this location you went to? I believe it was a house. I don't think there was anything else connected to it. Maybe a subdivision, but I don't think it was. Uh, I think it was might have been a house. And when you all arrived, were you still driving at this time? I believe I was driving, unless he took over at the gas station, but I'm pretty sure I was driving. And did Brian, uh, kind of, did, did Brian direct you from the gas station to that house? That right. To? And when you got there, what did you see? I uh, just saw a normal house. So we parked and got out. Was anyone outside when you arrived? I don't know if anybody was outside at the moment, but I think shortly after we arrived. And did you ever go inside the house? I might have stepped in for a second. And who did you see when you were inside? Um, there was maybe, couldn't tell you the exact number, but there was a few people. And At this point, there were some outside, some inside. Had you ever seen any of those people before? No. Had you ever been to that house before? No. Can you describe what were some of the people's genders, race that you were uh, interacting with? Uh, I believe Brian was the only white person there, uh, Mexican. I don't believe there was any Mexicans there. There were some black people there. And were you speaking with anyone there? Was Brian speaking with anyone there? Brian was speaking with the, them. I didn't say a word while I was there. And while you were there, why did you not say a word? I wasn't familiar. I didn't know the people. Uh, were you, uh, after, how long were you all there, roughly? After we showed up until we left? Yes. A good hour or two. Did you uh, ever get any weed or what you were looking for? No. Did, uh, where was your car once you went inside the house? Um, it was in the driveway. And uh, did anything ever happen with that car? While it was in the driveway? Correct. No, it stayed in the driveway. Did anything happen with the car while you were at this house? Um, yes, it was apparently borrowed. Um... How did they get, as you say, bar? What do you mean by that? I don't exactly know how this happened. Um, I do remember being really faded, uh, kind of in and out of what I would say consciousness. I was pretty messed up, trying to look for the next high. I don't really recall what the conversation was, but someone had mentioned that they needed a car, uh, to borrow a car. Didn't expect mine to be borrowed. Uh, next thing I know, my car's gone. And had you, you said, uh, you were faded, what were uh, you using back then? Everything under the sun. And was Brian using it along with you? Yes. And did you all use before you got to the house? I might have, I don't exactly know what he was on, but I was a regular pill addict and... I'm sure. And when you, are you clean today? Yes. Um, and do, do you recall on that specific day, uh, what drugs you may have used either before? I couldn't tell you exactly what I was on. I would do whatever I had in the cabinet that morning. Understood. Um, and did you uh, give, where were the keys to the vehicle? In the car, I believe. And uh, did you, where were you when other people that wasn't you or Brian got in the car? Um, if I'm not mistaken, I was okay, on the... Do the form of question. Same question, Mr. Form. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Your Honor. Did somebody else who was not Brian and you ever get in that car? Did someone else other than Brian or me get in the car? I believe someone had to get in the car for it to leave. Yes. And where were you when they got the car? I believe I was in between, inside and outside, maybe on the steps. Did you see them get in the car? Um, don't exactly remember seeing them get in the car, but I've seen it pull off. And, uh, do you remember after this speaking with anyone in the Atlanta Police Department? Um, if I'm not mistaken, we left the place. 
just because we weren't getting any weed, we weren't getting anything, and it had been a good minute, so we left. Uh, closest place we could have possibly went to was towards the, maybe the gas station that we were at, and uh, that's, about, that's about what happened. We just left. I'm going to come back to where we were, but after all of this, do you ever remember speaking, speaking with, with the... Okay. Yes, I think his, he was a detective that was around the car whenever I showed up to it. And it was the same day that you arrived in the house, September 11th. Right, right, it was the same thing. And it was Detective Quinn of the Atlanta Police objection, Department. Objection, leading. A standing objection. Was it Detective Quinn that you spoke with in the Atlanta Police Department? I cannot recollect. Do you remember speaking with him uh, that day? I do not know who Mr. Quinn is. But did you speak with a detective on scene by the car? Yes. And was this, when you were speaking with him, was this before or after the car was far up? This was before or after, sorry. And uh, when you gave him that statement, do you remember speaking, or do you remember speaking with him in that moment? Yes. And did you, uh, when you spoke with the detective, uh, do you remember, or did you tell him what was what happened that day fresher in your memory when you spoke with him that moment? Um, at that point, I think I was just saying anything to get myself out of trouble. I was really scared of getting in trouble for buying weed. And so I was fabricating a lot of the things. Did you tell anyone else? Did you speak with anyone else other than the detective? I think there was a bunch of news cameras there that I spoke to. I think I might have been on the news. You spoke with the news? Yeah. At that point, I told him something completely different than what I had told the detective. Can you describe the person that you lent the car to? Uh, I did not lend the car to anybody. Question and mischaracterization of the evidence. I say, could you please stop speaking the objections? It's objection basis. I don't need an explanation, Mr. Adams. Make your objection, Judge. Did you ever loan the car to anyone, Mr. I stand the objection as to form. Was that car ever loaned to someone by you? No. Did you ever get the keys to Brian? I don't believe I handed him the keys. When you spoke with Detective Quinn. Objection. Basis. Your Honor, may I have what was the basis, sir? Objection. Facts not in evidence. Form of the question. Your Honor, this is a piece of the Hold on, hold on. I stand as the form of the question. When you spoke with the law enforcement officer, did you tell him that you gave the keys to Brian Ransom that day? Um, I could have said a number of things that were not true. Did you tell the law enforcement officer that you gave the keys to Brian Ransom on September 11, 2020? I do not recollect. Did you tell, did you let Brian Ransom borrow your car? That shouldn't have an answer. I'm going to overrule the objection, Mr. Adams. What was the question? While you were at the house, did you right. let Brian Ransom borrow your car? I don't think I let him borrow the car. I didn't let anybody borrow the car. Do you recall telling the detective that you let Brian borrow your car? I do not recollect that. How many, uh, did you see anyone who went into your car? I did not. I stay in the question. Do you recall telling... Detective Quinn, that you saw four black males get in that car. Objection assumes facts not in evidence. I'll overrule that, sir. I do not recollect anybody getting in the car. How long did you stay at the house after your car left that location? It had been about two hours. Do you recall telling Detective Quinn that it was about three to four minutes before that car left? That you heard police sirens? No, I do not. No, it was a good bit. Did you ever see that car again after it left the house? After it left the house, yes, I saw that the where it was wrecked. How did you know where to go? We just went to the nearest gas station. Do you recall telling Detective Quinn that you heard police sirens and followed him to the car? No. Once we started walking, we saw all the police, and luckily we were already out, and we felt something was wrong, so we went towards where they were going. 
coincidentally, they were going the same way that the gas station was at. So your testimony today is coincidentally, y'all had to walk to the car where it ended up? No, we went to the gas station that was nearest, and that's where the police and everything was wrapped up. Do you recall hearing police sirens at that house after your car had left? Only once we started walking towards the gas station. Did you interact or see, did anyone at the house you were with ever say anything about any police that came by? I don't believe so. You don't believe so? No. Did you, did anyone at the house seem to, that you were with and did not know, uh, have any reaction to any police sirens that went by the house? I don't believe so. I think it was just me. Why did you get a feeling about your car that you just had? Because I'd been there for a very long time. My car had not returned, and I couldn't get a clear answer on where my car was. I didn't know anybody there, so my first thought was that my car was not in the right hands. Why did they take your car that, that, that day? Um, um, speculation. A standard question. What was your personal understanding of why the car you drove there was needed to be used by somebody? Objection causes speculation. One of the questions does, I'll sustain it. Not exactly why, but you yourself, who was physically present, what was your understanding of when your car left? Did you think it was stolen? Did you think they were going to the store? Did you think they were going to church? What did you think your vehicle was traveling to? I do not exactly know where they were going to. I had heard something about them needing cigarettes or diapers. Did you expect that your car would be brought back? Um, well, yes, once I knew that it was gone, I rechecked with Brian, just kind of asked him um, what was on my car. He said, don't worry, be back. So at that point, I uh, probably kept smoking. I just kept sitting around. I was, I almost remember falling asleep for a second, it was so long and then waking up and my car still not being there, just kind of being in and out, and yeah, finally taking off. So Brian knew where your car went as well? Objection leaving. I same question. You just testified that Brian told you it's cool. What did you mean by that? Um, that everything was okay, that I didn't <coughs> need to worry about anything. So was Brian aware that your car left? Objection calls for speculation. I same the question. What did you take Brian to say that it's cool after the vehicle you arrived there with the I said where house. I said where's my car? He said don't worry about it, we'll be back. When you asked him where's your car, he said it's cool, Objection don't worry. To the hearsay. Calls for hearsay. Your Honor, this is his direct testimony a second ago. I'll rule the objection, Mr. Adams. Sir, when you just said you asked Brian where's your car, he said it's cool. Were you under the impression that Brian knew where your car went? I was under the impression that yeah, that my car went somewhere and that somebody knew where it went. I felt, if I felt like it, like no one knew where I went, I probably would have left and looked for my car. At that time, did you trust Brian? I trusted Brian, yeah. So when he told you that it was cool, what did you, how did you react to that? At that point, I was just content. I was cool. What address did you and Brian Ransom arrive to? To when we found the car? Correct. Uh, at the same gas station that I think we stopped at. When you first got to that house, you didn't know anybody. Mm -hmm. What address was that? I do not know the address. Do you recall telling Detective Quinn it was 2233 Macon Drive when you and Brian Ransom arrived to the car? Absolutely not. I'm going to object improper foundation for refreshing recollection. Your Honor, this is impeachment, not refreshing recollection. I will rule the objection. <clears throat> do you recall what any of the males who got in the car were wearing. Objection to the form of the question. And mischaracterization of the evidence. I'll overrule the objection. You can answer the question, sir. What was the question again? Sorry. Do you recall what any of the, the males who got in the car were wearing? Absolutely not, no. Do you recall telling Detective Quinn that one of the guys is wearing a white shirt, a white t-shirt? No. Do you know uh, how quickly they got into your car when they, when they jumped into it at that house? No. Do you recall telling Detective Quinn that the four black males got in your car like this? 
Uh, at that point, I was telling whoever the detective did anything to get myself out of the situation. Did you ever tell, before you talked to Detective Quinn that day, what, did, did you and Brian ever speak together about what you would tell the police? I don't believe so. Did you ever tell the police, uh, did you initially tell the police that your car was borrowed from the house? I think initially I said that I was at the gas station and it got stolen from the gas station. So your first statement to police was that the car was stolen? Yes. It was recorded and then he erased it and uh, he's re-recorded it. Re-recorded? Another statement. He said, uh, that's lies. Tell me the truth. He said, I'm going to delete it and record again. I said, okay. You're talking about the detective? The detective. That day? Yes, sir. Do you recall telling Detective Quinn exactly what... Do you recall telling Detective Quinn that you and Brian initially told the police that the car was stolen, but now you're going to tell the truth? I don't get the form of the question, excuse me. Do you recall telling Detective Quinn that initially you and Brian told him that the car was stolen, but now you're going to tell the truth about what really happened? Yes, I believe it was. That's the case. It, we initially said it was stolen just to get out of our, get everybody out of our hair, and uh, yeah, that was not true. And you and Brian discussed what you would say to the police the before you gave the first statement. I stand the questions to form. Did you and Brian? Discuss that story of the car being stolen before you first spoke with the Atlanta police uh, detective? I don't believe so. I think uh, we just kind of both thought that was the best answer. And I believe that's why he erased the first statements because he separated us and asked us and they didn't match up. So he recorded it again. <coughs> Excuse me. When you spoke with law enforcement on September 11, 2013, were you in a courtroom? No. <clears throat> when you spoke with law enforcement on September 11, 2013, were there television cameras? I believe there were television cameras. That were directly listening to you in the detective's conversation? No. No, they came at me before I spoke to the detective. Were all these people that are currently in the courtroom around you when you spoke with the Atlanta Police Department detective on September 11, 2013? The question was, was there anybody here? Correct. No. <clears throat> and sir... Today, you don't remember anything of what you told the Atlanta Police Department detective on September 11, 2013? I stand in objection. Sir, do you recall what you told the Atlanta Police Department detective on September 11, 2013? I do not recall what I told him exactly, no. Thank you, sir. No further questions. Cross. Denalo <laughs> Flores, good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. All right. Um, it's fair to say you don't remember a whole lot about that day back in 2013, 10 plus years ago. Is that true? That's true. All right. Um, you do remember some things, right? Vaguely. Um, 
You do not know who the police officer or detective or investigator was that you spoke to, is that right? No, I do not know. So when the, the prosecutor keeps asking about Detective Quinn, Detective Quinn, you don't know if it was Detective Quinn you spoke to or someone else, right? No, and never since then I've been getting a lot of calls from different parties. Not exactly sure which side of the party it is. Okay. Um, so I've been, I've had a few different statements over the phone and stuff like that. Um, they're okay. probably all different. All right. Whether or not it was Detective Quinn, you do remember speaking to someone that day, uh, a law enforcement officer, right? Right. And fair to say, my words, but you, you lied through your teeth to the, to the, the officer. Basically, at that point, I was saying anything I could to get myself out of the situation, and a lot of things were fabricated. But one thing that you do recall is that whoever the law enforcement officer, the detective on that day was that you spoke to, you gave him a statement, and then instead of keeping that statement, that law enforcement officer erased your statement that you gave initially, and then went ahead and recorded something else, right? That's what I was told, my understanding of it, yes. Okay. Now, um, chronologically, I'm going from, from the beginning. You're dating Miss, uh, at that time, her name was uh, Cisnera. Yes. Maricela, mm -hmm. right? You're dating her at that time, you borrowed her car on that day. Yes. At some point, got to make sure you speak up loud enough so the court yes. can hear you. Got you. Um, at some point, you end up in the car with Brian Ransom. That's your friend. Right. His nickname is uh, Skateboard, something like that, right? I'm not, I don't know him by that, actually. Okay. Brian Ransom is his name. Right. Okay. You all end up together. You all are, uh, I think you said you were headed towards the mall, mm -hmm. right? Right. Ultimately, you all are going to go try and buy some weed or try and buy some drugs. True? Um, at the very initial, it wasn't that case, but after we left the mall, yes. Okay. Um, Brian knows where to go get some weed or to go get some drugs, right? Right. You were kind of, you were already high. Yes, I was pretty, at that point in my life, I wasn't doing very well. I was waking up faded, going to sleep faded. Okay, all right. Fair. And, and, and so you all end up in some part of Atlanta, you don't know where. Right. Okay. Um, you all go to a gas station, true? True. Um, you all meet up with someone at the gas station. Um, I'm not exactly sure if we met up with anybody at the gas station after the mall. I think we just uh, stayed there and stalled. Maybe my understanding was that we didn't know where we were going. Okay. Um, could have possibly been that we were going one place and he switched it up on me okay. at that point. Um, it could have been a number of things of why we were there. I didn't ask questions. Like I said, I was sitting there nodding out on the car. Okay. Okay. Ready for him. Go from the gas station. You end up at a house. All right. All right. No, no one forced you to the house, right? No one came and kidnapped you from the gas station and said, hey, um, come on over to the house, right? No. You all end up at the house because you all are there looking to buy some drugs. True. Right. True. You all get to the house. You all are there trying to get some drugs. At some point, I heard you say, you're, you're kind of faded. You're in and out of it. Right. Um, the car leaves at some point, right? Right. You don't know what the circumstances were under, under the car leaving, Right. Right. Um, you ask a lot of questions about the men getting in the car, the males getting in the car. You don't know who got in the car. I do not know who got in the car. I did not see that. Okay. So, um, Brian is there too, Ransom, right? Right. Um, car goes at some point in your head, you're like, <laughs> car ain't here. Better go find a car. Right. I don't exactly know how long it was before the, before the question of someone needed to borrow a car and it leaving. Okay. But I do remember it was a question, and maybe since it didn't leave right away, I didn't really think that it was going to be my car that they were taking. Okay. So once I noticed that it was leaving, um, I definitely asked Brian what was going on. He said everything was okay. Okay. At some point, you end up, you and Brian, I think, end up going down to the gas station, right? Right. Okay. Um, cars wrecked. Cars total. Okay. Um, at some point after that, now obviously you're, you're there and you're like, well, I, I, I got to tell Marisol, Marcel. And that's something. probably possibly my main worry at that point. Okay, because you got her car. Right. Her car's been wrecked. Right. You're on some sort of some part of town. You don't know where you're at. Right. Okay. She doesn't like my drug use. Doesn't. Not gonna like why I was there. Okay. And um, at some point you end up speaking to law enforcement. Right. right? Um, your main concern at that point is trying to. Um, not get in trouble for, um, A, being high and out driving around, right? Right. Uh, being at some location trying to buy drugs, right? True. Being at some location taking drugs, True. right? Uh, you end up, in your words, lying to the police officers. 
or, or whatever detective investigator was you spoke to, right? Basically, I was stretching the truth and not being very truthful with my words. Okay. Um, I think you said you were going to tell him anything you could at that point to get out of trouble. At that point, yeah. All right. So whether it was, um, you know, someone took the car at the gas station or someone stole the car from some location uh, or someone took the car from the house, whatever it was you needed to say, you were going to tell law enforcement at that point. True. And you did, all right? True. Okay. Um, now, at some point, did, did Maricela have to come and pick you up or did you make it back up to where she was? No, I, I think I had called her and she came pick me up uh, in her friend's car. Okay. I think her friend was with her. I want to ask you something about um, after you spoke to the, the, the law enforcement officers, right? Um, by the time you get done talking to them, there's a couple things that you have done. True, you have uh, been out buying drugs, right? Right. And you have given a false statement to the police that they appear to know is false, right? True. Okay. Were you actually on basis? He said that they know. What's the false. basis? What's the basis? Speculation, Your Honor. Old. At any point after, and this is September the 11th of 2013. At any point after that day or after that day, did anyone ever come back and charge you? with uh, either purchasing or attempting to purchase or purchasing um, drugs? Uh, no. Did anyone, any law, any APD, uh, detective, investigator, DA, anything, come back and charge you with giving a false statement to the police? No. Anyone ever charge you with any sort of RICO racketeering charge for yes. any of that stuff? No. Basis. Relevance. All ruled. <laughs> Sounds like you were in a bad place back then. Yes, sir. Things better? A lot, sir, thankfully, right. until this came up again. All right, listen, I appreciate it. That's all I got. Thank you, Judge. Any other examination? Oh, hold on, Mr. Atkins. Yes, sir. All right. <laughs> you, Mr. Brown, are very eager today. All right, come on. <laughs> all right, Mr. Short. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Just a couple questions for you. Uh, my name's Max Shard. To your recollection, um, when you arrived at the scene where the car was, did you observe any individuals lying on the ground? Did you see anyone who had been shot? I did not see a person that had been shot. I'd seen a lot of blood. You saw blood. Was that by the car? It was by the car. Okay. Um, how many, you said you spoke to law enforcement. Did, did you understand that person to be a detective or just a police officer? By the way, they're dressed um, without a badge, without a, or maybe he had a badge, just not visible with a suit like yours. I thought he was a detective. So this gentleman was in a suit and it was a male? Yes. Okay. And you only spoke to one police officer? Uh, I believe there was more than one. Um, that you spoke to? I believe so. Okay. The gentleman in the suit, is that the person who erased your original statement from their recorder? Yes. Okay. And I know that you've, you said that you don't recall that gentleman's name. Right. Okay. Um, do you recall what that gentleman looked like? No. Do you recall the race of that gentleman? I believe he was black. Okay. Um, you said he was African-American? Yes. Okay. Was there anything else you recall about the way that gentleman looked, the gentleman that erased your original statement? Do not recollect how he looked. Was there any other law enforcement, to your recollection, that recorded any statements? Um, on that day? Yes. No. So it was just one? I believe so. Um, unless the camera that was there before asking questions that was part of the news but it was briefly two seconds before the detective got to me and, and crossed me over the yellow line and it was the same gentleman that took your statement right. that erased your original statement right okay thank you i have nothing further
Anybody else? Mr. Matthews. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Just a, one or two questions. Uh, you remember when the prosecutors asked you moments ago whether anyone in this courtroom was present when you talked to law enforcement back on that day? Right. You remember saying no, correct? Right. And has anyone in this courtroom pressured you or coerced you to get up here and testify as you have this afternoon? No. Okay. Thank you. No further question. Anyone else? All right. Read Rick. Thank you, Your Honor. Sir, on cross-examination, you were asked that you don't know the circumstances of the car leave. Do you remember that? The circumstances of how I got, Correct. how I left, right. And on cross, you were asked again, you don't know who got in the car. Right. Remember that? And on cross, you were also asked, you don't know anything about this situation, right? In the situation, which situation? You were asked that. Objection, Your Honor, these were all asked to answer. You I'm going to overrule. I'm going to overrule. The, I'm going to sustain the objection on other grounds. So it's all leading. So he's, a, he's your witness on redirect. Yes, Your Honor. When you spoke with, what exact location were you at when you spoke with Detective Plank? I was beside the car. Is that the intersection of Macon Drive and Cleveland? If you know. I do not know. Is your birthday February 10th, 1990? No. What's your birthday? February 2nd, 1990. Did you tell Detective Quinn your birthday was February 10th, 1990? Absolutely not. You didn't lie about your birthday? No, that I did not lie about. And when he started recording, on the recording, Detective Quinn told you he just walked up, right? Um, no, I waved him down because he was walking around the car. There was a yellow tape all the way around it, maybe 30 feet away from it, 40 feet away from it. The whole parking lot of whatever establishment was there that it wrecked into had yellow tape all over it. I stood at the yellow tape. Kind of yelled at him a couple of times. He turned around, didn't pay attention, yelled at him again. I said, that's my car. He came up and asked me the questions. And what was the main reason that you walked up again? Because we were trying to leave the situation and f possibly find my car. I was tired of being there, not getting any weed. And my girlfriend had to be picked up soon. So I was hoping that we could do something. Sometimes maybe get to the gas station and ask for a ride from someone just to get back home or something. And did you ever see a, a wrecker or a tow truck when you were talking to Detective Quinn? No. Did you ever hear the sound of a wrecker or a tow truck when you were talking to Detective Quinn? No. Of, so, a, of an actual tow truck? Something getting the wrecked Nissan up off the ground. No, it was still definitely up against the building. So your testimony today is when you were talking with Detective Quinn, there was no tow truck or wrecker moving that Nissan? No. Do you remember if the detective asked you who you gave the car to? Um, I do not recall what he was asking. Did he ask you that? I don't recall that. And after he asked you that, do you recall what your answer was? I don't recall answering that question. You told him you didn't give the car to anyone except Brian, your friend? I could have made that up as far as giving him. Brian, the car. I didn't let anybody borrow the car. I'm not asking you of what you said you made up or didn't make up. I'm just asking you what you told Detective Quinn on September 11th. I do not recollect what I told him. And Sir, um, whose idea was it to borrow who brought it to your, did anyone ever bring it to your attention that that car needed to be borrowed? Um, no, I just overheard. Did you tell Detective Quinn how you came to know that that car needed to be borrowed? I do not recall telling what I told the... You didn't tell Detective Quinn that Brian told us some guy told him to borrow the car? I do not recall call that, no. That sounds a little fabricated. Did the, uh... Officer you were speaking with ever tell you to cut to the chase? I don't believe so. I mean, he was being pretty uh, blunt and pretty, pretty blunt with his words. He was being pretty cool. Uh, wasn't really being too professional. Uh, tell me that the first thing was bullshit, that uh, we needed to get our story straight and get it right. So 
So you're saying that the, the detective realized your initial statement of the car being stolen was, as you say, objection. Speculation. I stand the objection. Your testimony just now was that, in your impression, when the detective said what you just told us a couple minutes ago was bullshit, what did you mean that to me when he told you that? Did you think he believed your first story? I'm. Speculation. I stand. Hold on. I stand the form of the question. You can rephrase it, sir. Or when you speak with someone and they tell you that what you just told me was bullshit, how do you take that? Just as a person. As a person, I if I'm lying. I understand that, and I take it as I'm taking bullshit. And if I'm not lying, I say that they're full of bullshit. And if they, if someone tells you that, or if you tell someone that, does that mean that what they just told you you don't believe, or you do believe? Possibly that I don't believe them. Now, did you ever get lost when you got when you and Brian arose to this house? I felt like I was lost the whole time. Did you know any of the street names? No. Did you let Brian Ransom borrow the car? No. You recall telling Detective Quinn you entrusted Brian with the car and you let him borrow the car? He never borrowed the car. He was never in the driver's seat of the car. I don't believe I handed him the keys at all. I'm asking you what you told the detective on September. I do not recollect what I told the detective. Did you hand Brian the keys to the 2004 Nissan? No. I believe the keys were in the car. Did you tell Detective Quinn that you gave the keys to Brian? I, I stay in the question. That was Mr. Shard and Mr. Um, Harvey, I believe. Who? Did you ever tell Detective Quinn uh, how short or long one of the male's hair was that entered the Nissan Alto? No. You never told him that? Not to my recollection. And you testified and were asked on cross about when Brian told you it's cool, the people who just took your car. You remember that? Right. He just told me the, situa the situation was cool. He didn't really explain what was cool about and it. And after he told you that, how quickly was it that people got in that car? I, I couldn't tell you, maybe 20 minutes, 30 minutes. So your testimony today is Brian says it's cool, don't worry about it, and 20 or 30 minutes passed before you could get in the car. Oh, no, the car was already gone whenever you told me it was cool. Do you recall telling Detective Quinn that Brian told you it's cool and then four people jumped in the car? I do not recollect that. I did not see anybody jump in the car. And when people got in the car, you realized the car left. Was there anyone else at that house? I believe there were still some people left there, yes. Yes, because we stayed there and we still smoked and uh, got even higher. What did y'all smoke? Marijuana. And did you tell, did you ever tell Detective Quinn if you felt like Brian knew the person who just left our car? Um, excuse me, one more time. Did you ever tell Detective Quinn that you felt like Brian Ransom knew the people who borrowed your girlfriend's car. The whole time I believed that Brian knew them, yes. And specifically the people who got in the car. Um, I believed he knew everybody. So not specifically, but I felt like everybody, he knew them. So obviously, yes, I believe that. And was your car them. being used, was it being used as a favor? Um, I wouldn't, I don't know if he actually was doing that favor for them or what. Didn't you tell Detective Quinn, obviously this dude knows this cat, do him a favor? Well, that's what I would assume, yes. So that's what you told Detective Quinn? I don't know if that's what I told Detective Quinn. Had you ever been around the guy that you went to car to? No. And was the gas station that you first went to, was it nearby or far away from the house? Pretty far away, I believe. I think it was 10, 15 minutes. You didn't tell Detective Quinn that the gas station was somewhere near? Um, near enough to walk to it. So was it far away or near? Um, depends what you consider about far on walking, maybe like 20 minutes. And did you ever tell Detective Quinn that you never even went to a gas station? Um, no. 
You never told the tax that? Not to my recollection. Like I said, at that point, I was telling him a lot of lies. And when you first walked in the house, was Brian talking to anyone? I believe he was the only one talking. Did you see any guns in the house? No. Did you see any guns on anyone? No. How, what direction were the police sirens that came by the house? What direction? Yeah, where were they going? It sounded like they were going away from the house. And was it multiple cop cars or just a couple who went by the house? It was a few of them with their sirens on. Did your yeah. stomach drop when you heard police sirens? Uh, not really. Um, Did you have any thought that it was related to your car that you slept? Not at that point, no. Did anyone at the house, when you saw the police sirens going by, did you ever tell Detective Quinn about any of their reactions to that? Um, no, like I said, we were getting ready to walk off, and that's whenever I heard it. I don't think I made a big deal about it I, in my head. I kind of suspected maybe that uh, something wasn't right, but uh, everyone else just kept on their cool, just like the whole time. And I just felt like the only outcast thinking too much. You didn't tell Detective Quinn that the guys who were there did not say nothing, they just had this look in their eyes? <laughs> no. You never told Detective Quinn that? I don't recall telling him that, and if I did, that's not really true. I don't did anybody roll by that wasn't a cop and honk their horn or do anything like that when you were at the house? No. You didn't tell Detective Quinn that guys rolled by and said, what the fuck happened and started honking? I don't believe so. Did anyone at the house start making any phone calls after these police sirens started swarming by the house? No. You didn't tell Detective Quinn that the guys at the house started calling? I don't believe I remember anybody at the house at that point doing any kind of calling to anybody. Did anybody at the house speak with you, or did anybody at the house, after the police sirens were rolling by, make any reference to the people who just left it? The objection, call. Call. you're safe. I, I'll sustain the objection. Without saying what they said, did you ever tell Detective Quinn that anyone in that house said anything within earshot of you in relation to the four people who just got in your car and took off? I don't remember, no. How did you get to the car? Walking. How did you know where to go? Um, I believe at this time I'm still following Brian. He's the one with the GPS and I'm just floating around. After your car was borrowed, how did you know to go find the 2004? I was tired of waiting. How did you know where to find it? Uh, it was just the nearest gas station, and we didn't know where to find it. We just wanted to get to a gas station so we can call someone to pick us up or something. Um, we ended up at the gas station where there was yellow tape. When you talked to Detective Quinn within a couple hours after this, you didn't tell him the only way they yeah, went to the gas station? Facts and evidence. Your Honor, facts and evidence. Facts and evidence? Yes, sir. I'll sustain the question as to form. You can go ahead and rephrase. Yes, Your Honor. When I you talk with... Did you talk to Detective Quinn the same day that your car was borrowed? Uh, I talked to a detective, yes. And was that days or hours later from when the car first left the house? I mean, how, how long was it? It was hours. It was a couple hours? I believe it was a couple hours. So it wasn't all that long? Um, no, but my recollection of time is pretty phased out. So is it fair to say that you talked to Detective Quinn with what you just testified to a couple hours after the car was taken? Is that fair? Um, yes, I could be wrong. It could have been four or five hours. In general, a couple hours is fair to characterize? A few hours, yes. Okay. So, a few hours after your car was taken and borrowed, mm -hmm. do you recall telling Detective Quinn that you were walking, the only way you could find it was to follow the cop lights? Did you tell Detective Quinn that? No, that was just, I don't recollect telling him that, no. Did you ever tell Detective Quinn about if you wanted Brian to get in any trouble? No. You didn't tell Detective Quinn that you didn't want your buddy to get in trouble? Uh, at that point, I didn't want me or him getting in trouble because we were there purchasing weed and I thought that's what the main problem was. Did you tell Detective Quinn that? I don't believe I told him that. I don't recollect what I told him. At the very end, when you were speaking with the detective, do you recall what you told him? No, I think uh, at this point I had told three different stories. 
Did you tell Detective Quinn that this interview is the absolute truth? I uh, don't exactly remember that being said. Have you been following this case since you were speaking to testify? No. How do you feel? How did you feel when you got speaking? Uh, I felt like it was a jury duty thing. I didn't pay much attention to it. My involvement in this was very small. I thought it could just blow over. And no, I kept getting bothered. My mom kept getting bothered. My brothers were getting bothered. Um, so I just kind of felt I should see what's up with it. And now I know the grand scheme of it, I feel like. Or at least how more complicated it is than what I thought. So. Uh, that, that's fair. Uh, has this case caused any trouble in your house? Yes. Why? Um, this is something I wanted to put behind me. This is something I didn't want to ever really, I didn't think it was going to be like that. I've worked so hard to get myself straight. I'm a recovering heroin addict. Um, I've been through a lot and I feel like this was way in the past and didn't really feel like bringing up this story to any one of my family members. Ever since they have found out that I am, I am the one with the RICO charge. So it is very, uh, it's sad to say the least. I'm getting... Did you ever, were you ever offered to have anyone from DA's office come meet with you and talk about that day? I don't exactly know who has been calling and wanting to meet, but there's been very many people, I believe, calling to want to meet for testimony, sir. Why did you not let them come meet you and talk about it? Because I thought my part in this was very irrelevant. Did they ever ask you if they could meet on Zoom? Um, don't recall that. Did they ever ask you if they could meet on Microsoft Teams? I don't remember that. Did they, I don't even know what those are. Did they ever uh, ask you to speak over the phone? That I have spoken over the phone. Did they ever ask you to talk about what you remember from that day over the phone? Several times. Um, did you only want to speak on the day of your testimony? I felt like it wasn't necessary. I didn't, honestly, to this day, didn't think I needed to speak ever. Did you, did you ever say if you got an email, did you have to read it? Um, I don't read emails. Um, that's just. Did you ever get the marijuana that you went to that house to buy? No. <clears throat> Thank you, sir. No further questions, Your Honor. Redirect, Mr. Adams. Yes, sir. Or recross, I should say. I apologize. Sir, let me, let me ask you just a couple questions. Um, when you were talking to the law enforcement officers or the detectives, right, on that day, did they, isn't it true that they told you or they were telling you things um, that they thought they knew? Does that sound about right? Um, don't exactly recall them knowing okay. what was going on. They did explain to me afterwards. I asked what happened to my car, and they briefly explained what happened. So they told you. They, they gave you information. Basically, yes. In addition to asking you questions, they're telling you stuff as well, right? Right. All right. Um, you were subpoenaed to come here today, weren't you? Right. Okay. What time did you get here? Uh, I got here at around 11. 11 o'clock. All right. Um, you were subpoenaed, as you understand it, by the district attorney's office, right? Right. Okay. Um, from the time that you got here, did anyone offer to take you upstairs and let you look at your statement, your old statement, or any recordings or anything that you had given from back in 2013? Um, the question was, has anybody... Yeah. Did anyone from the DA's office say, hey, you're here, um, come upstairs and talk to us, we'll, and we'll tell you what we're going to Yeah, just a second ago, I talked to these two people. A second ago? Uh, yeah, just right before the, I before walked they, in. Right before they brought you in? Yes. Okay. Um, over the course of the past number of months or, or past couple of years, uh, anyone ever, uh, I mean, you live somewhere, you have a home, right? Um, now I live with my girlfriend, yes. Okay. Um, anytime over the course of the past few months, anyone come to your house uh, to attempt to interview you there at your house? Not personally my house. They have came to my mom's. They have came, uh, uh, they've called my brother. I don't believe they've came to my work yet, but um, I think that was what they said they would do. Okay. All right. 
did ask you a question a little while ago, right, about um, whether at the end of your statement interview you said something to the detective or investigator, whoever it was, about whether um, everything you said is the absolute truth or something like that, right? Right. Um, your response, if I heard you correctly, was um, if you did say that, <laughs> it wasn't true, right? Right. You, you told, that it, you told I think in your words, at least three different stories about what happened that day. Yes. It was clear that, that a lot of things that you told the detective, a lot of things that the DA was asking you about, whether you said to the detective, just wasn't true, right? Right. Okay. You don't have any idea um, what happened uh, with the car once it left your presence until you saw it again. You don't know what happened, right? I have no idea. You're, you're not able to tell this jury from any personal knowledge that, uh, hey, this person got in the car or that person got in the car or the car went here or what happened. You don't know anyth anything about that? No, it was just all what I was being told. Yeah. You had the car, and then at some point later on, you saw the car, the car was wrecked, all right? Right. All right. Oh, my God. Thanks, sir. Mr. Short, anything? No, Your Honor. All right, Mr. Matthews? No, Your Honor. Thank you. All right. Anything further, Mr. Atkins? No, Your Honor, and this witness can be probably excused. All right. Um, Okay, Mr. Nava Flores, um, we're going to permanently excuse you as a witness. You're free to go about your use of dues and avocation. Just don't discuss your testimony with anybody except the attorneys in this case, okay? Got it. Right. Thank you, Your Thank you for your patience with us. All right. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, um, given the hour and given what counsel have indicated to me, this might be a natural stopping point for us for the day. So let me go ahead and just kind of just re recap where we are. So tomorrow, what time are you supposed to be here? 12.30. 12 okay, and we're going to work a little bit in the afternoon. And then, um, then the next time we'll be here will be Monday morning. the 26th, and if I could have you all here for 10.30, okay? We'll anticipate 11 o'clock start time. All right, and we'll probably work till sometime deep in the afternoon, all right? Um, and then I'll kind of give you the breakdown of the days after, after that. We're still going to be down, as I mentioned, for administrative days from the 5th through the 12th of... Um, of March, okay? All right. What are your ministerial inquiries of me, ladies and gentlemen? And bless you. Anyone? The day of the 27th, is that a full day? Say again? The day of February 27th, is that a full day? That's Tuesday. Right. Um, That may be a partial day, okay? Uh, and I'm thinking about that we work during the morning because uh, the court has some unrelated business related to my duties as a chief that I may have to take up in the afternoon. So looking at my calendar, that would be a, a reason by hypothesis we go a couple hours, a couple, three hours in the morning, okay? On 27th. Anybody else have any other questions? Anyone? Okay, let's review again. Um, leave your notepads in the basket take a sticker um, please do not discuss anything that we have uh, talked about or you've heard uh, in uh, open court uh, because of course you have not been given the instructions by the court so it would be error for you to or for it be a violation of this court's admonition for you to go ahead and do that um, 
do not discuss the matter um, as you're going to wherever it is and how you're traveling to and from the courthouse. Don't talk to it uh, about the about the case with your relatives, friends, and well wishers. Do not go on any third party sites uh, or listen to any news accounts or any other. Um, reviews of this particular case. This is it going on because remember what I told you, you can't consider those sources. You can only consider what's being presented in this courtroom. Um, if anybody should try and talk with you, reach out to you, uh, otherwise contact you, of course you let Deputy, sorry, I should say Sergeant Ingram and myself know immediately. Okay? Um, and again, ladies and gentlemen, I can't thank you enough for your patience and your flexibility with us. And I say that on behalf of all of our advocates and parties. Okay? Um, unless you have anything else, anyone going once, twice. All right. So tomorrow morning, um, ladies and gentlemen, twelve thirty, right? Yes. Okay. All right. For anticipate one o'clock start time. All right. Enjoy your evening, ladies and gentlemen, and we'll see you tomorrow. Okay. All right. All right, he gets a jingle around. All right, ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. Our jury has left us. All right, um, Anything I need to be made aware of or take up before I recess you all for the afternoon? Um, yes, Mr. Adams. No. No, I, I don't. I, if if um, I don't believe I've gone that far, is that yeah, at least that day in terms of telling you what I was going to do. But it would probably be um, sufficient that we will probably start um, around, take a couple hours of testimony. I would say probably between nine and around eleven thirty, and then we probably recess for the rest of the day. So I can take up. Some other things or motions, depending upon that time, okay? All right, thank you. All right, anybody else? Your Honor, as it relates to the open records request, we are working on those. I wanted to give the court an update that. Um, thank you. Yes, and I wanted to make sure that the court was aware um, that we are working on those right now as we speak and have been since. We left the court yesterday. So we will give the court and the parties the most current update we have after we are able to um, confer with our team after we leave the court, uh, court's presence in a few moments. What next? <coughs> um, let me ask you all a, a scheduling question since we... Since the 27th, we're going to be here a couple of hours. Do you have motions that, or other matters you, um, we can take up? Yes, sir. All right. Why don't we? Well, go ahead, sir. What do we? What do we have that 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 we can take up for a couple of hours on that morning? Because then I can recess or I can give our jurors that ticker period off. Um, Um, Your Honor, we have, um, yes, we have uh, Mr. Motion Limine number 38, I don't, it's just argument, 39. Hang tight.
Okay, 38. Yes, sir. 38, 39, uh, 41. Mm. Those are the ones I'm showing right now, yes, sir. For Mr. Williams. None of them, though, is any witness. So, you know, it's just, uh, I don't believe that they're going to take a tremendous amount of time. Maybe an hour total, but I'm, you know, <laughs> just uh, estimating, and you've told me, and other people have told me I do not do time work very well. Now, none of you all estimate time very well. Whatever lawyers tell me, I double at a minimum. Mr. Brown told me 20 minutes for a certain witness, and we took two hours. So, you know, I, my, my confidence is low, low on attorney estimation time. All right. However, I say that. Okay. Um, Wes, you have. Um, I have 38. I don't have 39. Okay, fine. Yeah. And then. Okay, so uh, Mr. Williams has 38, 39, 41. And then also there is a. Motion for production of supposed visitation. That is done, sir. It's done? That was correct. To my knowledge, that was satisfied by the state. All right, can we produce an order? Um, and uh, Ms. Love or Ms. Tilton saying that's been done? Yes, Your Honor. All right, thank you. What about the motion to exclude or, or redact? Um, Mr. Winfrey's conviction. That's uh, true. Uh, we need to argue that one if the state intends to uh, put that in evidence. I assume they do, but I guess I don't know. I also, yeah, is this, so is that the state's pleasure at this point in time, or do I need to defer? We need to be heard on that because we don't intend to redact. So. Okay, all right. What about, um, so we'll hear that. And what about the motion for notes recordings from Mr. Derek Wise? Yeah. We can respond to that because there are no, but we can respond. Also okay. To that. All right. So I'll try and take up as many of those things starting at, um,
Okay, um, so the, what I'll tell our jurors tomorrow is that they will be, we'll have an administrative day on the 27th. That's when we'll take up those motions um, that, that we've just mentioned in regards to Mr. Williams. Um, okay, another pressing issue I need to resolve with you all is... Um, Our jury, our juror issued juror, I believe, 204. Who's going to move? Because her lease starts on the 24th of February. So have you all found any other case law or any other, any other um, authority that I may be able to consider? I think that where I left it was, um, it's the court, from looking at the case law, there are no really cases on point. The only thing that the court is concerned about is at the time of the verdict, she would no longer be a Fulton County resident. And it's not a question like we, where we had, where it's waived and we didn't, she, and no, and we didn't find about it beforehand. Uh, well, we found out it beforehand. Um, this is just something that's come up. So, what do you all? What are your thoughts? So, Your Honor, um, we were still researching that issue, and if the court will permit us to address it at the end of court tomorrow, um, given that we are still—I got to tell her tomorrow, right? Because no, she's. Be, was, I don't want. I'm not, I'm not, I don't tomorrow. want to wait. To, I don't want to wait till the end of the day. Okay. Because I do need to rule on the issue so that she's, so that she she's apprised of that. Because her, her lease takes, I think, is effective the 24th. Um, or at the either the end of today or at the very uh, earliest tomorrow before we begin court, if the court will allow us at that moment, um, I can have a one-word answer, you know, for the court. <laughs> but I, I just want to make certain with respect to the case law um, that, that we are clear on it because I am where the court is now um, regarding not having a case on point and I just wanted to be as thorough as we could um, because I am concerned as well and if it is as if we suspect it is we will have no objection but I just wanted the opportunity to um, make certain of that. That's Y'all have had a few days already it's not the first time I've brought this up so you know I, I that's why I'm asking about it today because I gave everybody the opportunity to, to, to take a look at it so um you can you can have till tomorrow morning, but I want to take it up first thing. So, or uh, at one o'clock. Okay. Mr. Steele, anybody else? You find anything? Your Honor, I could give you the case, but all the cases what I told you, we're not waiving any issue, and that's always what comes up in the appellate court. So, yeah, I'm being upfront with the court. I'm not waiving it. We, we believe that she needs to be removed. If you don't remove her, we understand, but for appellate purposes, I don't want to catch the court blindsided up. It'll be raised on appeal guff that there's a conviction. Anybody else? I haven't been able to find any case law on this particular point. It, it falls on the court's discretion. Um, I think she's pretty... She, it's not like she committed misconduct. It's not like she didn't tell us. So, and it's just the eventuality that came up some... 10 months later after she said, well, I'm thinking about moving, so. And to be clear, we don't find any case law. We are not going to be objecting. I just wanted to, you know. Because I, just want, I just want to know if you all found anything else because, of course, my preference would be to, to have her stay, but right. I don't, you know, she got a First Amendment right to, to move where she wants to, mm -hmm. and I, I, can't, I can't kind of uh, abridge that, but. We'll but she's, but you know, she, you know. So, but my 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 ultimate concern is whether or not if if and when there is a verdict that she's not lawfully a resident of our county, and that's where I think um, the challenge would lie. I don't know what an appellate court would do, or later, uh, depending upon the circumstances. But you know, we we'll, I just have to kind of think about that. We just want to protect whatever happens. Okay. All right, so we'll take up that first thing tomorrow. Uh, and uh, other than that, anything else for me? Can I mention two? I, I look back, Your Honor. I left out motion for discovery number 24 is pending. 
if that could be uh, heard on... What's that in regards to, sir? That is regarding... That's a January 10th, is the... 2015 is the uh, the tragic killing of Mr. Donovan Thomas, and I just received uh, videos from an incident allegedly occurring in 2015 that I was told previously that the surveillance does not did not exist. I still can't play the surveillance. That's at a movie theater, so I want the court to be aware that I have been asking for. I put in writing. I want the videos, I think it's totally exculpatory from the McDonald's on Cleveland Avenue, as well as um, any street video traffic. Is that the, okay, you said that's Williams 24? Yeah, yes, Discovery, motion for Discovery 24. Then, Your Honor, um, there's also a motion to redact Mr. Williams' July 15, 2015 statement from the police and you admitted it over my objection so I'll say on my objection but your honor there are comments in there by detective Racy and detective Cunningham uh, with mr. Williams that the police were um, searched mr. Williams home that day that search and the evidence um, that were found that search has been suppressed previously as well as in this court so I just want the redaction and I could show the state where those areas are if they don't disagree with otherwise we have to come to the court and then the third motion that I just saw is a uh, motion limit number 40 I don't believe I said that to the court earlier and if we could argue that if there's time um, that's short also and that deals with um, uh, jail calls if the state is going to introduce jail calls if they state um, are uh, admissible of people who are not here or people who are here and if the court over objection allows those statements of the people who are here or alleged conspirators over objection the people they're speaking with are adding a lot of information I understand the rule of completeness but um, there's a lot that has to, I don't know which exact jail calls the state may want to introduce, but I'd like to give them a heads up that beforehand I will be objecting to any third party because it can't further, if it doesn't further the conspiracy, it should not be anyway. I hope I'm making myself clear that that's the additional motion that I failed to bring up earlier. And I don't know if the state wants to get together with me first giving what I believe should be excluded in the Mr. Race, excuse me, Detective Racy, Agent Cunningham, Mr. Williams statement. If that helps, I could do that. Otherwise, we can just do it in court. But if it's out of court better, maybe we should do it. And then come to the court. Hold on one second, Ms. Lowe. Judge, of course, with respect to the offer from um, Mr. Steele to get together and let him provide to us those portions that he feels should be excluded or redacted, we certainly think that that would be a good use of our time outside the court presence of the court. So we'd ask um, that, yes, 
Mr. Steele send over to us those portions that he believes should be redacted so that we can efficiently litigate that before your honor if necessary. Um, as his statements regarding his motion for discovery. Number 24. Number 24. We can argue that before your honor on Tuesday as he's been apprised of the status of that many times, but we will gladly argue that before your honor. And then, uh, well, it, depending upon how much time and where we are, um, Mr. Williams motion number 40, um, in regards to his statement, um, we can take that up if, uh, we, if we have enough time, if not, I'll schedule for another admin day. Okay. Yes. Thank you. All right. Okay. Anything else? Okay. All right, folks. Um, and I will see you all tomorrow at 1230. Okay. All right. Thanks. Be well. All right. Take care. We're in recess.